Hello there, science friends, and welcome once again to Photoshop for the Scientist. Thanks for being here. So in today's video, we're going to be doing things a little differently than normal. Um, instead of covering a particular technique or lesson uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at using Photoshop in general and how you can do so ethically with your scientific images, which I think is a pretty important thing to cover. So the basic game plan here is that I have this paper published in the Journal of Science and Engineering Ethics in 2010 by Douglas W. Cromie, or Cromie. And in this paper, Mr. Cromie outlines 12 basic guidelines that you should be trying to follow anytime you're working inside Photoshop or any other image manipulation program uh, with your scientific data. And so what I want to do in this, what I'm assuming will be a two-part video series, uh, will be to work through each of the 12 guidelines, um, give you some examples, and then sort of talk through what they mean. Um, so without further ado, let's get into rule number one. Okay, so rule number one. Scientific digital images are data that can be compromised by inappropriate manipulations. And so the idea behind this guideline is that you've got to remember that anytime you take any kind of digital image, at the end of the day, it's just a bunch of pixels. And every one of those pixels is going to have some sort of value associated with it. And to show you what I mean by that, I have this 8-bit uh, grayscale immunofluorescence image here that I've used in a previous video. And if we zoom in right, at, right kind of to the pixel level, and if I open up my information pane here, keep your eye on the RGB values. When I scroll around, you can see that sort of the darker pixels have values that are maybe like 0 to 10-ish. And my white pixels, in this case, I've done a poor job and overexposed. Um, but they kind of max out at 255. Um, grayish are kind of higher up there, too. But the idea is that every one of these pixels is just a number. And so anytime you go and manipulate your image, let's say if you wanted to increase the contrast or mess around with the brightness, really all you're doing is changing these <coughs> pixel values. So you can think of it like if you had a data set in Excel, if you're going to go and transform the data some way, you would apply the same transformation to your entire data set and not you know, just a couple of the values. Same goes for an image. If you're going to be manipulating the image, you want to make sure you're applying the same transformation to uh, the entire image and not just a part, part of it. Um, another consideration, uh, which I have aptly demonstrated here, is that you want to make sure you're sampling correctly. So when I was acquiring this image, I was a dummy and overexposed uh, this area here, among other areas. Uh, but when that happens, it's not great because you're losing some information there. So just for example, like this area could be technically brighter than this area up here, uh, but I'll never know that because they're so overexposed that it's kind of just maxed out at 255, so I'll never know. Same thing, you could uh, underexpose, or maybe, I don't know if that's the right word or not, but you want to make sure that you don't ever just have pitch black in the background too, um, because you'll get the same thing. You could be losing out on something that uh, is actual real signal, is just is dark, um, or on the low end of the scale. So those are definitely a few things to consider, even just during your data acquisition. OK, so that'll bring us to rule number two. <music> rule number two. Manipulation of digital images should only be performed on a copy of the unprocessed image data file. So I think this one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, but to give you an idea of how extreme you can get, when I worked in a GLP lab a couple of years ago, where record keeping was crazy, uh, we saved copies of everything. So for example, we would take an image, then we would save off a copy and add the scale bar, then we would save off a copy of that and do any tracings, and then we'd save off a copy and sort of just continue on forever. And while I don't think you need to be that crazy for your sort of day-to-day -day science in a regular lab, uh, at the very least what you should be doing is keeping your raw data separate from any sort of analysis. So I've just set up an example folder here. If you have a folder with raw data, let's say you've been on the microscope taking a bunch of images, first thing, first thing you should do is copy that raw data into your data analysis folder, and that's where you should be doing your data analysis and any sort of figure manipulation or anything like that. That way you can make sure that your raw data is always intact, so you can go back and look at it at any time. And also, uh, in some cases, the journal editor may even ask to see your raw data, or data that hasn't been processed at all, just to make sure everything is above board. And it would be pretty embarrassing if you didn't have it on hand. So uh, yeah, this is always a good one to keep in mind. 
which will then take us to rule number three. Number three. Simple adjustments to the entire image are usually acceptable. And so I wanted to spend a bit of extra time on this one because it might actually not be quite as simple as you may think. And so say you had an image like this where you might be tempted to adjust the contrast or brightness. And typically the way you go about this is to use the brightness contrast adjustment layer or even the image adjustments brightness contrast, which I'd actually not recommend since it's a destructive change, but we'll talk about that a different time. But say we do use the brightness contrast adjustment layer, which I'll turn on and open up the properties panel here. And I'll set these both to zero. <coughs> what I want to do is draw your attention to the histogram here. And if you're unfamiliar with the histogram, what it basically is is a visual representation of all of the pixel values in your image, ranging from zero, or black, to 255, which is white. And you can actually see the spike here in black from my black text, and the spike in white here from my white background. But I want to draw your attention to this area here, which essentially is all of my image pixel value information, or everything kind of in this area here. And so when we use brightness contrast, the first thing I want to do is click Use Legacy, and I'll explain this in a minute. But if I start to adjust the brightness and make it brighter, you can see my histogram start to shift to the right, or closer to the white values. Because what we're doing here is just increasing all of those pixel values, bringing them closer to 255. Similarly, if we make the image darker, we're just decreasing those pixel values closer to zero. Um, with contrast, I'm going to put this back to zero, what we're doing is essentially stretching this histogram out. So taking our black values and bringing them closer to black, or our dark values and bringing them closer to black, and our light values are bringing them closer to white. So you can see it's kind of sort of stretched out evenly. Now we want to be careful that we're not losing some of this information over the edge where it's being clipped, so I'll bring it down a bit. But this is probably acceptable. And so if you wanted to use this, I would say this adheres to this guideline. Now, the problem uh, is if you unclick Use Legacy, uh, this uses a different algorithm. And I'm not quite sure when it changed. Um, for the record, I'm using Photoshop CC 2015, which is the latest version. But if you keep an eye on the histogram here, um, if we're using this new algorithm, uh, you can see that the changes to the histogram are no longer uniform and they're actually non-linear. And I don't actually know exactly what the algorithm is that's being used, and I'm sure there's probably some internet smart guy out there that will be sure to let me know. But the important take-home point at that is that this is a non-linear change. And so like I alluded to earlier with rule number one, uh, you don't want to be making changes or transforming your data um, in ways that are non-linear. Or rather, if you're going to be applying a change, you want to make sure it's the same change to all your values. And in this case, that's not happening. Same with contrast. Uh, again, you're stretching the histogram, but it's still kind of a non-linear function. So if you're going to be using brightness contrast, you want to make sure that use legacy is checked. Um, but I find an even better way to work is using the levels adjustment layer. Um, and I like levels because right off the bat, it shows you the histogram. And so with this, you can increase the contrast essentially in the exact same way as before by stretching it out by taking your black and white sliders here. So with your black slider, if you bring it up right to the edge of where your histogram starts, um, same with the white, you bring it up to where it starts, you can see, well, first I should turn it on actually, uh, reflected in the histogram up here, you've just gone and stretched it. So you've taken this point here and stretched it to black and this point here and stretched it to white. And this is still acceptable and you can see exactly what you've done and how it's reflected. Um, one thing to note with this middle slider for your midtones, uh, if you start messing with this, again, this does kind of another non-linear transformation. So this is another thing you'd want to avoid, uh, at least if you wanted to adhere to this guideline. Um, so I'm just gonna set this back to one. So I would say this is a perfectly acceptable way to increase the contrast in your image. So I will close that off and we will move on to rule number four. Okay, number four. Cropping an image is usually acceptable. So I think this is another one that's pretty straightforward, but I'll go through it quickly here just for the record. Um, so in this case with this blot, if I wanted to crop it out or just highlight some of these bands here, um, I think a better way to work instead of cropping per se and deleting all of this extra stuff here, if you go back and see my video on using masks to retain image data, 
Uh, my preferred method is just to mask out what I want. So, for instance, if I highlight these bands here with the marquee tool and click the mask button, um, basically does the same function as cropping, but if I ever need to go back and see the rest of my blot here, uh, I can do that at any time. And trust me, that's a very handy thing to be able to do. But in terms of cropping, you just want to use your common sense here. Don't be a dingus and crop out a band because it just doesn't fit with what you're trying to do. Similarly, if you're doing something like cell counting, you don't want to crop out an area of a bunch of dead cells because that's just lying. And so that's really all there is to that. Um, let's go into number five. Numero five. Digital images that will be compared to one another should be acquired under identical conditions and any post-acquisition image processing should also be identical. Okay, so I don't really have any fancy things to show you for this one. Uh, just a couple of points to further elaborate on this guideline. Uh, first of all, whenever you're taking any sort of image data, any image ac uh, acquisition, let's say on a confocal microscope, uh, you want to make sure that you write down the settings every time. So bring your lab book down with you, write down like the laser power, uh, the gain, and whatever other settings you're using. And make sure that if you're um, imaging for multiple experiments or within the same experiment, that any time you go back down to the microscope, you want to be using those same settings. Uh, that ensures that the data that you're capturing uh, is consistent across all imaging sessions. Uh, so the second half of this basically is that if you do choose to do any sort of image adjustments afterwards, like changing the brightness or contrast or what have you. Uh, you want to make sure that you're doing the same thing to all images. And a great way to do this is using actions, which uh, I do cover in an earlier video. But when you use actions, uh, it allows you to record basically whatever you're doing. Uh, so say for instance you're changing levels, you re record it once and then you could apply it to the rest of your images and those same values will be um, applied to every single image that you use the action on. So that's just a good and easy and quick way of making sure that uh, any adjustments that you're doing are, are the same across your entire experiment. And yeah, that was a quick one, so let's go on to number six. <laughs> Last but not least, number six. Manipulations that are specific to one area of an image and are not performed on other areas are questionable. So in his article, Mr. Crummy states that one time where this might be acceptable is if you have a 16-bit grayscale image, for example, and you have features at both the low and the high end of the image that are pretty much imperceptible to the human eye. In that case, if you want to go ahead and bump them up so that your viewer can see what's going on, uh, that's okay. You just have to specifically mention in your figure legends that you've gone ahead and done that so everything's transparent. Uh, but he says pretty much every other time is not acceptable. And he specifically gives an example of if you have a Western blot like this, and I'm hesitant to even show you this uh, because I don't want you to use these powers for evil, but you don't want to be going ahead and just burning your bands in to make them look like they're darker than they really are. Because I think we can all agree that this is sketchy as hell. So, yeah, don't do that. Now... There might be some other instances where my own personal opinion is that I think it's okay. Uh, so my example here is that say you have a bright field image that you've taken and you've done a terrible job with the lighting as I've done here. And ultimately you should just go back and retake the image but if for some reason that's not an option. You know in Photoshop you can go and readjust the lighting so that it looks better. And like I said, this is my own personal opinion, uh, because I think the spirit of this guideline really is that you don't want to be adding extra data to the uh, image, or you don't want to be taking anything away. But if you're just making it easier to see so that you can get in and do your analysis, again, I think it's okay. I'm sure there are people out there who will probably disagree with me, but it is what it is. Uh, use it at your own discretion. All right, well, that does it for part one of this series. Uh, I will get to the second half of this paper at some point. Uh, this video took me forever to make for some reason, so I'm anticipating the next one will also take a little while. But for now, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below, and I will get to them as best I can, as always. But for now, I will sign off by saying, as always, remember, you worked hard to get that data. So if you're going to work a little harder to make it look amazing, uh, at least you should do so ethically. All right, so that's it for today, folks. Thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time.